Welcome to Brother Miller's Notes. I'm so glad you're with me today as together we look at sections 125 to 128 of the Doctrine and Covenants. Brigham Young had answered the call to serve a mission in section 118 of the Doctrine and Covenants. When he leaves in the fall of 1839, his family's sick. They're destitute. They don't have a lot of property. It's a very difficult thing that Joseph, or Brigham Young does as he leaves his family. It's difficult for him and it's difficult for his family. When he's in England, in section 124, verse 127, he is called as the president of the Quorum of the Twelve. He does a marvelous job in leading the Quorum of the Twelve in the missionary efforts in England. We have great success by the Quorum of the Twelve in England. When he returns in July 1841, he finds his family still destitute. They are living in an unfinished cabin, and he immediately goes to work to help his family. A week later, the Lord inspires Joseph Smith and gives a revelation that we know as section 126. And I love that just Brigham Young is told, you've done a great job. Verse 1, Dear and well-beloved brother Brigham Young, Verily, thus saith the Lord unto you, My servant Brigham, It is no more required at your hands to leave your family as in times past, for your offering is acceptable to me. I just love this little pause. I just love this little gem of verse where the Lord just reminds Brigham, you've done well. I accept what you've done. And right now, the time's not the time to go on a mission, but stick around in Nauvoo. And then I read between the lines, you're the president of the Quorum of the Twelve. And Joseph's days are numbered, and the Lord wants Brigham in Nauvoo to be learning from Joseph and how to lead the church when he's gone. Well, in the meantime, you have a very difficult experience happen to Governor Boggs. Now, Governor Boggs is not a friend of the saints. He issued the extermination order on October 27, 1838. As a result, the militia and other state authorities, and General John B. Clark's among them, used that executive order to violently expel members of the Church of Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints from their land and from their state, which in turn leads them into a forced migration to Nauvoo, Illinois. Well, that's 1838. Now, almost four years later, an assassination attempt is made on Governor Boggs, May 6, 1842. The crime was investigated. The sheriff was Sheriff J.H. Reynolds. He discovers a revolver at the scene, still loaded with buckshot. He realized that the night before, it was raining, it was dark, the suspect had probably fired it and lost the firearm because it had a lot of kick to it. He identifies that that gun had been stolen from a local shopkeeper. He identifies a person of interest, his suspect. He says, identified, quote, that hired man of wards as the most likely culprit. For the sheriff, he thinks he knows who did it. Governor Bogg refuses what the sheriff says, what he did, and he is sure that the assassination was ordered by Joseph Smith and it was Porter Rockwell that was responsible for it. So on July 20th, Governor Boggs issues a sworn statement saying that he believes that, quote, Joseph Smith, commonly called the Mormon prophet, was accessory before the fact of the intended murder. As a result, on August 8th, Joseph Smith and Porter Rockwell are placed under arrest. When they go to court, they are ordered free by the Municipal Court of Nauvoo. Joseph realizes that these individuals uh, who've come with kind of the party of Boggs, they have an extreme dislike for Joseph. They hate him. Governor Boggs really is not doing this being rational. He's just making the accusation. And as a result, he realizes these things are going to keep coming, so he goes into hiding. While he's in hiding, he just lets the saints know. He writes a letter and says, The Lord help me understand that the, even though these things are baseless, these accusations, well, people are after me, and for the safety of the saints, I went into hiding. Section 127, verse 1 says this, For as much as the Lord revealed unto me that my enemies, both in Missouri and in this state, were again in the pursuit of me, and inasmuch as they pursue me without a cause, and have not the least shadow of coloring of justice or right on their side in getting up of their position against me, persecutions against me, inasmuch as their pretensions are all founded in falsehood of the blackest dye. I have thought it expedient and wisdom in me to leave the place for the short season, 
for my own safety and the safety of my people. And he says, you know, I've left my business with others. They'll take care of it. And it's a very difficult thing, you know, verse 2, and for the perils I'm called to pass through, they seem but a small thing to me. And then he says, but nevertheless, deep water is what I want to swim in. It has all become a second nature to me. While he's in hiding, the Lord seems to impress very much on his heart and his mind the work that's going to take place in the temples. On the 15th of uh, August, Joseph Smith is going to give an address. It's very much related to the temple at a funeral of Seymour Brunson. Now, Seymour Brunson was baptized as an early member of the church in 1831. He was a missionary in Ohio, Virginia, faithful individual. In Nauvoo, he serves as a member of the High Council. He's a lieutenant colonel in the Hancock County Militia. He also serves as one of the Joseph Smith's bodyguard. And at his funeral, and I love that it's put on his uh, gravestone, it says this, quote, At his funeral, on August 15, 1840, the Prophet Joseph Smith publicly introduced the doctrine of baptisms for the dead. And then the quote from Paul, the Apostle. Else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead? If the dead rise not at all, why are they then baptized for the dead? That's 1 Corinthians 15, 29. And in that verse, Paul has no objection to them baptizing for the dead. He realizes people are being baptized for the dead and he uses it as an example. You believe in life after death. You believe in a resurrection. If people are wasting all their, or spending their time baptizing the dead, it's all a waste if you don't believe in life after death. So that's his example, one of his examples. All the members are so excited. They are so excited. This new doctrine, baptisms for the dead. So on that same day, you have people going down to the Mississippi River and being baptized, and there's not a lot of order in it. So for example, that day, August 15, 1840, Jane Naaman is baptized in the Mississippi River for her son by Harvey Olmsted. There's no witnesses there. They go back and report the baptism to the prophet. Now you think, okay, there's some things wrong with that. But from what Joseph taught at the funeral, he teaches about baptisms for the dead. He doesn't teach the order. And I just see the Lord impressing now on Joseph's mind while he's in hiding. You know, there's a little bit more to it than just a mother being baptized for a son. And there's a little bit more to it that you need to have recorders, you need to have witnesses. And so January 19th, 1841, Joseph receives section 124. Here are a few verses from it. So 28 to 36 are very much focused on baptisms for the dead. So for there is not a place on earth that may that he may come to and restore again that which is lost unto you, or which he hath taken away even the fullness of the priesthood. For a baptismal font, there is not upon the earth that they, my saints, may be baptized for those who are dead. For this ordinance belongeth to my house, and cannot be acceptable to me only in the days of your poverty, wherein you are not able to build a house unto me. So I pause for a minute. Baptisms for dead belong in the temple. But we realize you have a time period where you're very, very poor, the temple's not built, and I'm going to accept them outside the temple. But, verse 31, But I command you, all my saints, to build a house unto me, and I grant unto you sufficient time to build a house unto me. And during this time your baptism shall be acceptable unto me. Now if you look back in history, the Lord's saying, you got a little window of time here. You got enough time to get it done. But it's also a window. So there's going to be an end date where you're not going to be able to use the temple very much more, and we kind of find that out with after the death of Joseph Smith and the saints leaving Nauvoo. So here's another example. This is jo January 19th. That's when Joseph receives these verses. And then you think, okay, January 22nd. Now this is just a couple days. Elias Smith baptizes his wife Martha for his her sister in the Susquehanna River. The baptism is performed with no one else present. According to what Joseph Smith has revealed, is it valid or not? Well, it's valid. He hasn't talked about uh, witnesses yet. That was section 124. So now section uh, 127 is given a little bit more light and knowledge as Joseph's in hiding and he's just trying to understand a little bit more what the Lord wants. 
He receives these instructions September 1st, 1841, in section 127. Verily, thus saith the Lord unto you concerning your dead, when any of you are baptized for your dead, let there be a recorder, let him be an eyewitness of your baptisms, and let him hear with his ears that he may testify of a truth, saith the Lord, that in all your recordings it may be recorded in heaven. Whatsoever you bind on earth may be loosed, bound in heaven. Whatsoever you loose on earth may be loosed in heaven. For I am about to restore many things to the earth pertaining to the priesthood, saith the Lord of hosts. And this is 1841. you still got a lot more to understand about the priesthood. So that's September 1st. September 3rd, two days later, Martin Whitlock baptizes Henry Granger for his great-great-grandfather in the Mississippi River. Only they are present, and they immediately report to the baptisms of the Prophet Joseph Smith. Now we've had more light and knowledge on it, and you think, okay, is it valid or is it not? Now, September 3rd, it's not valid, because they're the only ones present. They don't have a recorder, and in section 127, the Lord said, you need to have a recorder. The second letter clarifies some things from section 127. Section 127 says, I'm going to write to you more later on on this subject because it's pressed on Joseph's mind. So then we get section 128, which is a letter that the Lord is saying, or Joseph is saying, the Lord's clarified a few things about these ordinances. So, clarification now, September 7th, Sharon Pratt is baptized for a small, in a small pond for Mother Louis George, George Lewis. The church recorder is the only other person present, and he records the baptisms for the church records. You think, okay, is it valid or not? Well, here's a verse 3 where it's going to help us know. Now, in relation to this matter, it would be very difficult for one recorder to be present at all times or do all the business. To obviate this difficulty, there can be a recorder appointed in each ward, we call him a ward clerk now, of the city, who's well qualified for taking accurate minutes. Let him be very particular and precise in taking the whole proceedings, certifying in his record what he saw with his eyes and heard with his ears, giving the date, names, and so forth, and the history of the whole transaction. Naming also some three individuals that are present, if there be any present, who can at any time when called upon certify the same, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. So you need the recorder there, but you also need at least two witnesses. So you go back to this one. He is the only, they're baptized, the recorder's there, but no witnesses. Is it valid now? No, because further light and knowledge on this ordinance had been given. October 1st, John Williams baptizes Frank Gorringe for his great uncle in the Mississippi River. William Brown and Herman Silas are also present, as is the ward recorder. We'd say the ward clerk today, Jacob Hansen. Brother Hansen makes a record of the baptism and the names of those present and submits it to the general church recorder. I mean, yeah, I'm asking is it valid or not, but you know from what the Lord has just now said, that is valid. And then Joseph announced two days later that the temple's up enough that no more baptisms are going to happen in the Mississippi or any river. No more baptisms outside of the temple. You have to have all these baptisms for the dead in the temple. And you have work just starts to go on the temple and get the baptismal font because people are anxious to have their dead baptized. And November 8th, that baptismal font is dedicated by Brigham. Now let's do one more valid or not. So October 3rd, no more baptisms until the temple baptismal font is completed. And now we have a week later, Kristen Black, on October 11th, is baptized for her mother by Wilson Carr in the Mississippi River. There are several witnesses, including General Church Recorder, who records the name of the witnesses present and all their necessary information. Is it valid? The answer is no, because Joseph had said, no more, but Lord doesn't want any more baptisms until the temple is done. Your window is shut on that. So, verse 128, verse 1, I just love the way kind of Joseph, it's been on his mind, this, this work for the dead as he's in hiding. Verse 1, as I stated to you in my letter before I left my place, that I would write to you from time to time and give you information in relation to many subjects. Now I resume the subject of baptisms for the dead, as that subject seems to occupy my mind and press itself upon my feelings the strongest since I've been pursued by my enemies. Wilford, Wilford Woodruff noted that this preoccupation on work for the dead 
was very, very strong in the life of Joseph Smith at this time. Wilford Woodruff said, The prophet's soul was wound up with this work before he was martyred for the words of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. He told us that there must be a welding link of all dispensations and the work of God from one generation to another. This was upon his mind more than most any other subject that was given to him. For the rest of Joseph's life, you see the temple as the focus of his ministry. In 128 verse 6, Joseph notes, And further, I want you to remember that John the Revelator was contemplating this very subject in relation to the dead. When he declared unto you, as you will find recorded in Revelation 20 verse 12, I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Joseph notes that consequently the books spoken of must be the books contain the records of their works and refer to the records which are kept on earth. And the book which was the book of life is the record which is kept in heaven. So you have records that are on earth and records that are in heaven. And you think, okay, what are the records that are kept on earth? Some of them have to be those that we're doing for those who are, are passed on. The work that we perform in temples needs to be recorded. President Spencer W. Kimball also noted that we are those records are used in our judgment, and there are some records that can be very beneficial for us to have, and he encouraged us to keep our personal records, our personal, what we call them, journals or, or diaries. He encouraged this. We renew our appeal for keeping of individual histories and accounts of sacred experiences in our lives, answered prayers, inspiration from the Lord, administrations in our behalf, a record of the special times and events of our lives. From these records, you can also appropriately draw as you relay faith-promoting stories in your family circles and discussions, stories of inspiration from our own lives and those of our forebears, as well as stories from your scriptures, our scriptures, and our history and our powerful teaching tools, I promise you that if you'll keep your journals and records, they will indeed be a source of great inspiration to you, each other, your children, your grandchildren, and others throughout the generations. Verse 9, Joseph goes on in his letter. It may seem to you as a very bold doctrine that we talk of, a power which records or binds on earth and binds in heaven. Nevertheless, in all ages of the world, Whenever the Lord has given a dispensation of the priesthood to any man by actual revelation or any set of men, this power has always been given. Hence, whatsoever those men did in authority in the name of the Lord, it did truly and faithfully and kept a proper and faithful record of the same. It became a law on earth and in heaven and could not be annulled according to the decrees of the great Jehovah. This is a faithful saying. Who can hear it? In the Nauvoo Temple, a baptismal font was made. Baptismal fonts, its purpose, the way it's, the way it's situated, the way it is in a temple, was to be a similitude of the grave, as one who goes into the grave and comes out. And that's baptism too, right? Your old life, old person dies, you come forth as a new, res or new disciple of Jesus Christ. Temple baptismal fonts are also the likeness of the resurrection of the dead as in coming forth out of your grave. Baptismal fonts are designed to be in, quote, a place underneath where the living are wont to assemble. So you have them usually under the ground. Now, we do have some temples where they're not under the ground, but they're on the lower level underneath where the living are wont to assemble the rest of the temple. For example, the Hong Kong temple, where it's more of a skyscraper, the New York temple. Twelve oxen are symbols for twelve tribes of Israel. You may notice as you go in, each ox is different. And I love that that's that little variety uh, representing the different tribes of Israel and maybe us as individuals in Israel. In ancient Israel, the ox was symbolic of strength and power. We do get a lot of strength and power in our baptismal covenant. And so are those who have passed on will receive strength and power through making and keeping their covenant. The bull and the wild bull are symbols of the people of Joseph, as represented by his two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. And that's found in, in Deuteronomy 33, 17. 
back to section 128. And now, my dearly beloved brothers and sisters, let me assure you that these are principles in relation to the dead, and the living cannot be lightly passed over, as pertaining to our salvation, for their salvation is necessary and essential to our salvation. As Paul says concerning the fathers, that they without us cannot be made perfect, neither can we without our dead be made perfect. There is that symbiotic relationship where they're helping us and we're here because of them and we can bless them by doing these, these ordinances for them. Joseph does quote Paul, else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead? If the dead rise not at all, then why are they baptized for the dead? He also quotes the last chapter of Malachi, verses 5 and 6. Behold, I'll send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And ye shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the hearts of the children to their fathers. Least I come and smite the earth with a curse. And I love the way Joseph says it. I wish he would have done it. He says, I might have rendered a plainer translation to this. I really wish he would have. That would have been awesome. But it is sufficiently plain to suit my purposes as it stands. It is sufficient to know in this cause that the earth will be smitten with a curse unless there is a welding link of some kind between the fathers and the children upon some subject or another. And behold, what is that subject? It is the baptism for the dead. Now, Elder Anderson kind of keyed off of that welding link and said this, The prophet Joseph spoke of this work as a welding link, connecting families together from one generation to another. The physical welding link in Joseph's day was created by softening and melting two pieces of metal in a fiery oven, joining them together while they were still malleable, and then letting them cool and harden into an unbreakable chain. The importance of the powerful spiritual welding that binds us all together forever is stated clearly in the scriptures. We without them cannot be made perfect, neither can they without us be made perfect. In the past, this work of finding family names, documenting them, and bringing them to the temple was principally the work of older members of the church. Why was that? Because it required enormous time and effort. It would often begin with large reels containing microfilmed records. It meant painstaking attention to dates and places, thick historical books with limited availability, and at times remote country cemeteries. County, yeah, country cemeteries. Our ability to find our ancestors online has emerged only in the past few years with tremendous advancements in the past few months. The months ahead will bring even more availability. While your generation has become extremely devoted to visiting the temple, in the months and years ahead, you will be just as outstanding in finding and bringing names to the temple with you. I want to challenge each of you to set a personal goal to help prepare as many names to the temple as baptisms you perform in the temple. There is something powerful in searching out those who need temple ordinances, learning who they are, and then being a part of their receiving sacred ordinances. This is how you become, quote, saviors on Mount Zion. There is a joy and satisfaction that is understood only through spiritual feelings. We are linked to our ancestors together. President Nelson amplified these words when he said this, Elijah's return to earth occurred at the first temple built in this dispensation, when he and other heavenly messengers under direction of the Lord entrusted special keys of priesthood authority to restored church. Moses committed the keys of gathering of Israel. Elias committed the dispensation of the gospel of Abraham. And Elijah would come to turn the hearts of the, children, the fathers to their children and the children to their fathers. With that, natural affection between generations began to be enriched. This restoration was accompanied by what is some called the spirit of Elijah, a manifestation of the Holy Ghost, bearing witness of the divine nature of the family. Hence, people throughout the world, regardless of religious affiliation, are gathering records of deceased relatives at an ever-increasing rate. And I pause in the middle of his quote. I love that definition of what the spirit of Elijah is. A manifestation of the Holy Ghost bearing witness of the divine nature of the family. President Nelson conclude, er, continued, Elijah came not only to stimulate research for our ancestors, he also enabled families to be eternally linked beyond the bounds of mortality. Indeed, the opportunity for families to be sealed forever is the only real reason for our research. The Lord declared to the prophet Joseph Smith, These are not principles in relation to the dead and the living that cannot be lightly passed over, as pertaining to our salvation. For their salvation is necessary and essential to our salvation. They without us cannot be made perfect, neither can we without our dead be made perfect. Now in this lesson, this may be a great time, you know, depending on your timing, what you have, just to say, hey, let's have a little bit of time where let's get on family search. Let's see where we're at. 
how many of our ancestors are is work done for? Are there any that we can do maybe in the next month or two? It may be a time to have one of your family history consultants come in and just say, I'd love to meet with you and help you out, to help you get started, to help you maybe continue on. And maybe you have the aunt or the uncle who's done a lot of this work. Maybe part of it would just be today, you call up the aunt and the uncle and say, how can I help? You are the guru of the family. What can I do that would help? I promise you, they've got an hour of things that they'll talk to you about, right? And I love Joseph after he's talked with this topic. This has been pressing on his mind. And then he just asks a rhetorical question. Now, what do we hear in the gospel? For some, they get this topic and they feel guilt. Or maybe they feel shame. Maybe they feel how imperfect they are. Maybe they think, ah, oh, this is just too time consuming. Or maybe this is too much commandments. This is just too much. But as Joseph wants to remind us, what do we hear in this gospel? It is a voice of gladness. This gospel is a voice of mercy from heaven. This gospel is a voice of truth out of the earth. This gospel is glad tidings for the dead. This gospel is a voice of gladness for the living and the dead. This gospel is glad tidings of great joy. And we can't forget how wonderful the gospel is and how much joy it can bring in our lives, the lives of our family, and the lives of our family who've gone before us. Shall we not go on in so great a cause? Go forward and not backward. Courage, sisters and brothers, and on, on to the victory. Now, I usually end these with a teaching thought, and I'm going to end one with Joseph Smith's teaching thought, because I think it's just built right into section 128. In section 128, he says this, Let us, therefore, as a church and as a people, and as Latter-day Saints, offer to the Lord an offering in righteousness. Now, you could pause right there and just, okay, there's a personal invitation. Offer the Lord today an offering in righteousness. Be a little bit better. Repent or turn back your heart to Him. And, we can put the ad now in, let us present in his holy temple when it is finished. Now we have temples that are unfinished or when we can go, right? A book containing the records of our dead, which shall be worthy of all acceptation. So maybe that's the teaching thought is, okay, what act of righteousness will you do for your family that's gone, but gone ahead? Will you present their name and have an ordinance done for them in the temple. That their record, the record of the dead, will be able to be there. I believe that today we can offer an offering to the Lord in righteousness. We can have, be, have our ancestors a part of that book that's written in temples containing the record that their ordinances were performed. Thanks so much for spending some time with me as we've talked about these sections of the Doctrine and Covenants. I love the work of the Lord. I love the gathering that's happening on both sides of the veil. Have a great day and keep smiling.